All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, uh, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine. And uh, we're delighted to be uh, hosting journalist uh, D.T. Max here to talk about his new book, uh, Finale, Late Conversations with Stephen Sondheim. Uh, Sondheim was famously private and guarded, uh, but he did agree in 2017 when he was well uh, into his 80s uh, to be interviewed by Daniel for what was uh, supposed to be a, a New Yorker profile. A total of five lengthy conversations followed that ended in 2019 when the interview stopped because of Sondheim's hesitations, uh, the pandemic, and ultimately his, his death in 2021. And now Daniel has expanded um, on those interviews, uh, mixing his own commentary uh, to produce this study of the influential composer and lyricist, uh, who was, uh, of course, a master of, of difficult, daring musicals. Uh, the result, said Publishers Weekly, is a nuanced and sympathetic portrait of a notoriously private figure in his waning years, enhanced with Daniel's own astute and earnest perspective. Uh, Daniel um, is not a theater or music critic, um, uh, but he is a longtime a fan of Sondheim and, and a staff writer at, at The New Yorker. Uh, he first contributed to the magazine in 1997 and, and joined the staff in, in 2010. Uh, he's the author of two previous books, The Family That Couldn't Sleep, uh, which is a cultural and scientific study of uh, prion disease, and Every Love Story is a Ghost Story, a biography of David Foster Wallace. Now, in conversation with David uh, will be uh, Lou Bayard, a, a writer of historical fiction uh, whose acclaimed novels include the murder mystery, The Pale Blue Eye, uh, which has been made into a movie uh, recently re released on Netflix and actually showing, uh, it'll continue to show uh, at a theater here in, in DC for another week, starring Christian Bale. Other works of Lou's include the best-selling Courting Mr. Lincoln, the young adult novel Lucky Strikes, and, and Jackie and Me, uh, published uh, last June. Uh, Lou also teaches fiction writing at George Washington University and chairs the Penn Faulkner Awards. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Daniel Max and uh, uh, Louis Baird. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, yeah. Okay. he's going to start, and we'll just we'll go from there. Um, thank you very much for hosting us and for uh, um, including me in the incredible calendar of events that Politics and Prose uh, has been able to put together. Um, so I'm just going to read you a, a little a sort of what was called the prelude in the book. The book's divided into five sections, and it starts with why. I wrote this book, and this saves um, the obligatory first question from the interviewer, which is, why did you write this book? So this is the answer. I always wanted to write about Stephen Sondheim. Actually, long before writing about Sondheim was a possibility, all I wanted to do was to meet Stephen Sondheim. In the spring of 1977, when I was 15, my mother went to a benefit for the Phoenix Theater. The event included a performance of Side by Side by Sondheim, which was a review of the composer's songs. So she came home with a two-record album of the show, and it was signed on the front by Hal Prince, who was the artistic director of the theater company, in kind of big, bold magic marker. And below that was Sondheim's signature, uh, in a more delicate hand, his S's like two treble clefs. Now, I had never seen a signed Booker album before, I didn't actually know that people did that. Uh, but on the album cover, Sondheim in profile glared off into space, and behind him hovered the logos for his many musicals, nine amazing shows, and he was still only then in his mid-40s, and his imposing body language, his chin up, his arms crossed, seemed to promise there'd be plenty more on the way. So my family lived in a large Upper West Side apartment, but my parents agreed on very little, and as a result, Many of the rooms had almost no furniture. 
But in our living room, there did stand a gorgeous walnut paneled KLH Model 20 Plus stereo that had been the subject of some extraordinary fights. But it had survived the marital altercations, and it was, in fact, the one piece of furniture in a large, empty living room. So my father was a lawyer, and he would put on Dave Brubeck's Take 5, which was a favorite of his, and he would put it on, and then he'd slide over the arm and then slide back the arm. Anyway, any of you who are old enough to know what I'm talking about will know that a record will play forever if you do that. And indeed, he did play Take 5 for hours, and we would all have to listen to it. But every once in a while, my mother, or in fact it may have been me, would sneak in and put one of the Sondheim records on the spindle and let that drop. And a different sort of sound would now fill the living room, spinning on top of the gyrating pile. Now I soon understood that Sondheim's witty, intricate songs were special. It's true they weren't as singable, and definitely not as whistleable, as Take Five. And his characters didn't sing to express overwhelming emotions or resolve simple doubts the way most characters did in musicals. Instead, Sondheim's characters were actually it seemed to be made of doubt, made of missteps, and made of ambivalence. Marry me a little, side by side by side. The complexity extended to the music itself, which Sondheim filled with tricky rhythms and harmonic improbabilities. Now, several of the songs on the album were from the musical Company, and that group of arch, insecure, promiscuous frenemies. I asked myself, was that what life was really like? And even in my mid-teens, I guess that the answer was, in fact, yes. Sondheim's music captured perfectly the New York that I grew up in, with its graffiti-filled subways and pot-filled parties, its uncertain adults, and its adult children. Over the next four decades, I never got over my sense of having a special connection to Sondheim, that he was in some way writing to and for me. And I should say that a number of critics ever were like, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you and who else, right? Um, but I did feel that strongly. Um, and then in late 2016, I saw his name on a list of possible profile subjects at The New Yorker. So apparently, the composer and lyricist now had a new musical coming out based on two movies by the director, Louise Bunuel. Now, this sounded too good to be true for me because Bunuel was a director I absolutely loved. And then there was the Sondheim part. So now, the opportunity was obviously appealing, but I wasn't really sure how much fun it would turn out to be. Because to the extent I now knew anything about Sondheim's public persona, his reputation was that of someone who guarded his privacy carefully. In 1998, when he was nearly 70, the fact that he had spoken candidly about his homosexuality was treated as some sort of revelation. Now, to be sure, I could see why it might be mistrustful of the press. Even into the 1990s, many serious critics, including some who admired his overall aesthetic goals, stated mixed feelings about his work. And in fact, if you go back and look at the reviews of Sondheim's musicals, you know, this man we now recognized as the supreme genius of musical theater in our time, there are almost no entirely positive reviews. And even people who now claim to have been there early at the revolution, if you actually look at the reviews, are like, well, I like the first act, second act, not so much. Um, in the end, of course, Sondheim did outlast those critics. A new generation grew up who embraced his work without reserve. To them, everything before Sondheim in musical theater was dated, and those works created in their own time, if they were any good, owed an obvious debt to Sondheim. Here's an example from Lin-Manuel Miranda writing a couple of months after Sondheim's death in November 2021. He wrote, anyone who tells you that Sondheim isn't an influence on their music or their work is simply lying. But that was the end, the triumphant end. The trip through the woods had surely taken its toll and over time Sondheim had developed a public persona that was brassy and comic. He was happy to talk, but he often kept things impersonal. Still, it seemed it would be worth a chance. So I wrote an email to his assistant to ask if the composer lyricist might be willing to be profiled by me. Not long afterward, to my surprise, I got an email from Sondheim himself. Dear Daniel, if I may, he wrote, and he signed off yours, Steve S. Yes, he would be happy to sit for a portrait if I was interested. Not that the note was without guile, and in fact, I think I would have been extremely disappointed if it had been. For example, he wrote that he was flattered, flattered to be asked. Now that sounded just ridiculous to me, and I ran it by my editors and they agreed it was about the dumbest thing we'd ever heard, given that he had by then won eight Tonys, eight Grammys, a Presidential Medal of Freedom, and had a Broadway theater named after him. We all agreed he could probably live without a New Yorker profile, especially as it turned out that he'd already had one about 10 years before that we'd all forgotten about. 
He pointed that out to me, acting as if it was his fault that I hadn't noticed. I sent him a copy of a biography of David Foster Wallace I'd published a few years before, and he responded soon after, I would say suspiciously soon after, that the first sentence in my book reminded him of a first sentence he had just read in a memoir in that week's New Yorker, and he pointed out the parallels. He did not say if he got beyond the first sentence, or like the rest, uh, in either case. But when I offered a date, he accepted, so apparently I had passed, or so I thought, some sort of audition. As I got ready for the first interview, I realized that despite decades of admiring his work, I could not remember even the most basic things about him. I did not know where he was born. I didn't know where he grew up, how he began his career. I didn't know who his friends were, where he lived. I didn't know what he looked like now that he was an old man. I didn't know how he spoke. I did not know if he composed on a piano or if he composed in the bathtub. I didn't know which of his musicals he loved best or whether the words came first or the music, but I did remember one of the characters in Merrily We Roll Along who, when answering that same question, says that when asked what comes first, the words of the music says, the contract. <laughs> I did not know if he had siblings or a partner, an ex, hobbies, pets, vacation, home, secret, she had the idea. I thought about my ignorance and I asked myself if it would irritate him. But I didn't think so. I would explain that there were three or four songs of his that were so familiar to me, I couldn't remember when I'd first heard them. Those songs had changed my life and I wasn't trying to be a critic with him. I wasn't trying to be some sort of a maven. I was just one of his listeners. And one thing I strongly suspected was that Sondheim wasn't actually waiting for any critiques that I might have to offer anyway. He would want to be control of the discussion, the goal of which would certainly be to tutor me. I hoped I would be able to push him just far enough out of his routine to get a fresh glimpse of who he was. But to do this, I wasn't going to try to impress him. It might be nice that I liked puzzles and rhymes, as I knew he did, but he had, I presumed, access to the conversation of the most remarkable people on the planet, and I did not include myself in that group. And anyway, these thoughts were just guesses, and doubtless they left a lot out. In the end, what I would try to do is have a conversation, much like two people who happen to sit next to each other on a flight and don't quickly come to wish it was shorter, or who are seated together at a wedding because the marrying couple thought they might have something, at least something, in common. I wanted what took place between us to be humble, unremarkable, non-interviewee, a conversation. One thing I had in my favor, I felt, was that he was old now, it might be a time of new openness for him. The Sondheim in my profile would in many ways be familiar, of course, because how could he not be? I mean, if you've ever interviewed your grandfather, you know that you're going to get some of the same stories that you got before. But it was possible, too, that in this most reflective time of life, he might come out a bit more nuanced, a bit more complex, a bit more Sondheimian. So one day, in January 2017, I found myself in front of a series of low connected houses in the East 40s. The word masonette was going through my head. What were the possible rhymes? Red Corvette, Press Gazette, Raisinette. It was January, but it was mild, and it was evening. Pink sunset. I walked down a few stairs and rang an unmarked doorbell, phone rings, door chimes, and in went me directly into a living room like an old stage set. Thank you. Thank you for, for making my job easier, too, by setting that up. That was very, was very nice. So this was, the book is a collection, it's, it, in its core, is, is several uh, interviews you did. Three? Five. 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 Three that were, that were published in Talk, Talk of the Town. Two. Oh, wait, there's the, okay. Anyway, yeah. I, I, swear, I swear I've read the damn book. I swear I've read the book. Um, but, but what fascinated me um, is the... The way you front load the seduction that goes on between a journalist, between an interviewer and a subject, it seems like you are, you're constantly asking yourself out loud on the page, how did the last date go? Did he like when I did that? You know, would he be receptive to that? Is that something that happens with all interview subjects or is it, was there something about Sondheim that kind of called up that strategy? Well, I, I mean... I think that Sondheim was a very self-aware person. Mm -hmm. And so, as you would imagine from his music, you become more self-aware when you're with Sondheim. So everything that we're doing in these conversations is on the one hand just an interview, and on the other hand it's an interview. And I was very aware that he knew the form. You know, he's a veteran. I mean, he loved to be the veteran. And so I think it played more of a role. But I would say, I mean, and I will always say, that I didn't see it as 
a manipulative or carefully orchestrated encounter. I really went where he went. Mm -hmm. um, it's true I didn't bring up things that I thought he would hate, <laughs> but you wouldn't do that in an ordinary conversation. You meet someone at a wedding. I mean, to me, the, of the two examples I give, the, the flight and the wedding, I really thought it was more like two people, you, you, the marrying couple sits you next to each other. You have a whole dinner, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know and you're going to have to get through it. And that was that I thought I should be amusing to him, and that he, that I could be I couldn't pretend to be amused by him. But I mean, he was Sondheim for Christ's sake. Like I was going to be amused by him. I mean, this is a guy who had you know, as he had access to every conversation, and had written the most amazing things. Like, what what could he say? I wouldn't be interested. Mm -hmm. So that side was the easy side. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there are sort of little breakups sprinkled along the way too. Oh yeah. Um, you talk about at one point you use this line. It was a startling moment. You use a line from West Side Story. You were in love, or so you said. I wrote that to him. <laughs> yes. And what did he say back? He said, "You forgot the next line. I should have known better." <laughs> and then he wrote, "And now I do." <laughs> no, he's very clever. He was game. I mean, you know, it, it, I don't. I've never thought that I changed his life by showing up when he was 87 and taking, you know, five days out of his life, but he was game for it. He, you know, he had, he had fun with it. He liked competition and he liked puzzles and an interview is a kind of competition, a kind of puzzle with a certain kind mm -hmm. of person. And I had grown up in that environment and he clearly had too. I mean, for what it's worth, like everything in that introduction has an echo later in the book. Like I have my stereo, he has this Cape Heart stereo, which like, played both sides of an album that he describes in loving detail at some point. And the fights my parents have have an echo in the fights that his parents have. I mean, he was famously hostile about his mother. And, and in fact, one of the first things he said to me, which I thought was kind of extraordinary, because she had been dead. I mean, he was 87. I mean, this say, is Foxy. Foxy, yeah, Foxy Sondheim. Yes. Now they, I mean, they say you never get over your childhood, and this was certainly proof. But one of the first things he said was, my mother was a star fucker. And I was like, you know, I didn't even ask. It wasn't like, so what, what was your mother like? I mean, he really brought yeah. her up. Yeah. Um, so it was, that stuff was really close to the surface for him. You know, part, part of the work was getting past the shtick, right? I mean, there was the shtick. There was the getting past the shtick. There was the art of getting past the shtick. There was the meta shtick <laughs> above the shtick. This, he, was not, he was no one's fool. It's interesting, though, because I think by your own admission, you didn't go into this as a Sondheim completist, as a musical theater completist. There were things that um, he had to educate you about. Who was who Yip Harburg, for instance? You know, stuff that a musical theater geek would, would, would know. But I'm, you also say the best way to prepare is sometimes not to. And I'm really struck by that. Is there is some advantage somebody who's not an expert has in approaching somebody like well, Sondheim? Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's the kind of thing that they used to say, don't try this at home when you... The Jack Lalanne exercise. <laughs> I mean, you know, an interview is different than a feature, right? A newspaper interview, I don't know how many people even care about this, but I mean, a newspaper interview involves being able to sit in a room generally with someone and get something out of them that they maybe are, would like to withhold from you. That's a classic interview. So you can't go into that knowing nothing, right? But, but a New Yorker piece, I mean, I was anticipating seeing Sondheim 10 times. We got to five. Um, <laughs> you can slowly build up like what you know and be taught. You can't do that in a single interview. And it's not appropriate for everyone, but with something like Sondheim, I mean, you really, I had already, I mean, I intuited, I think correctly, because there's a moment in the book where I'm with him at a, at a pen event and he's surrounded by people saying like, you changed my life, blah, 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 you know, and he didn't like it. I mean, he, most people don't. You know, I mean, I think that's a low percentage play. Most, I feel like most creative people, even geniuses like Sondheim on some level, don't feel known when you do that. They're not their work. Mm -hmm. And they feel you're confusing. I mean, I wrote this bio for David Foster Wallace where I felt that very, very strongly. And he says that over and over in interviews and written pieces. Like, you know, it doesn't feel, it doesn't make him feel seen or, or real when that happens. And I think Sondheim is sort of, Similar. So to come to him and say, you know, I, I, I know that, you know, your first musical was Saturday Night and I know that, you know, it was written by the Epstein brothers and I know that the producer died and it was shelved. You know, I don't think that was what he, I mean, you can learn anything on the internet these days anyway. So I mean, the other thing is the bar 
for putative expertise. I'm not talking about really true expertise, yeah, yeah, yeah. but a certain level of fluidity is so low. I thought he'd want to tell me. I mean, I thought, I thought let him tell me what he wants to tell me at 87. You know, and it seemed he was okay with that. He seemed, to, I mean, he seemed yeah. to prefer it. Yeah. Right. I mean, he, there's no moment, surprisingly, where he goes like, "You are so, you know, poorly informed that I really would like them to send someone else." <laughs> In fact, sort of the opposite. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I also feel the reason he don't try it at home is, I brought, I'm not exaggerating, I brought stuff to him he didn't know, cultural yeah. things, and he was very curious and very competitive. So at one point, I bring up. Just by chance, the Anglo-Catholic poet uh, Francis Thompson. Man, I remember him. I remember looking at his face, like, and he's like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. oh, well played. You know, <laughs> <laughs> don't know this name. Might have to just dig this thing up when you leave, um, and rhyme it. And rhyme it exactly. <laughs> um, the the anxiety of influence is one of the things that comes through here. He doesn't um, like to admit that he had. Um, Influences. At one point he says, I don't think I've really learned, really learned from any musicals. I think that's an extraordinary statement for him to make. He obviously would have learned from Rodgers and Hammerstein. Well, he, from does Gersh make an, yeah. he does say, yeah. and I say, well, what about Hammerstein? Because, you know, Sondheim famously went when he's like, he's a sort of abandoned by, his parents break up, and in this weird sort of twist of fate, he and his mother live in Bucks County right down the road from Oscar Hammerstein. I thought that was Sondheim. I, I was like, was that sent in the clowns? But, um, uh, and so he obviously learned from Sondheim. I mean, famous, uh, from Hammerstein. Hammerstein famously marked, said, write, write three musicals. I, do you remember the details? One you, one you love, one, you, one from a book you love, one from a book you hate, and one from a book that starts with the letter M or something. I mean, it was just like, he was just teaching him. I mean, an amazing yeah. class. But, you know, remember that, so, so, th that that moment happens after the sort of most awkward moment in a book that's full of awkward moments, <laughs> um, in that I had asked him what he had learned from Andrew Lloyd Webber. Oh yeah, I went yes. Yeah, yes. and so those are that's, fighting words. Those yeah, are fighting well, words. Well, you know, and and so it, this is a, this is a, comes into the heading of you step in shit, you get your foot out of shit, you step in shit again. <laughs> so I said to I said to him, you know, well, what do you think of Andrew Lloyd Webber? Uh, and he interpreted me as asking, as he wrote to me in an angry-ish email, you know, you were looking for some sort of marketable response, um, which I thought was slightly out of date. I mean, I, I don't really think that if, if Sondheim had said, I don't like Andrew Lloyd Webber's music, which I think is pretty obvious, uh, I don't think that would be a New York Post headline in 2021 or 2019. It may have been in, in 1974 it would have been. Mm -hmm. So I thought he was slightly overrating how much I mean, yeah, Playbill would run it, but I mean, I don't think it would be like, you know, Sondheim, Sondheim to Weber, drop dead. I mean, I just don't think that's where we're going at this point. So on the other hand, you know, it was very present for him. And so he interpreted me as like fishing for a negative quote. Now, I mean, I'm not saying that if he had said that to me, I wouldn't have, but it was, you know, there are no pull quotes at the New Yorker. It wouldn't have been, you'd have found it at word 6,738, you know. Um, so then I made things worse by saying that I, I, I meant it. I, I was like, you know, I, was, I thought maybe there was some way that, you know, that, that Weber used a diminished eighth in Sunset Boulevard that gave you a thought maybe for balance. You know, and that was worse because it was one thing to be a journalist fishing for a marketable quote. It was another thing to suggest that he might have actually learned something <laughs> from Andrew Lloyd Weber. So that... that that caused a, a hiatus. We were we were put on hiatus for a while after that one, but you know, back we back eventually. But you you stayed in touch. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that if he hadn't died, that you would have gotten to your ten yeah. interviews? I, I do. I mean, I, I've thought about it a lot, um, and I really think so. There's five interviews, and after the fifth interview, um, we we break up slightly more than we broke up before, but not really completely. And then I'm not in touch with him for about a year or a year and a half. And that's my choice, really. Um, I'm not saying that he would have had me over for Thanksgiving. But, I mean, I was not in touch with him. And I, I felt, because he had told me he wasn't working successfully on his Bunuel musical. And I didn't know what we were going to do without that. Um, but I do think that if he had pivoted and been able to move forward on that 
and been happy with it that he would have had me back over for for a few more visits yeah i i do i i think i think he was a pro and i think as a pro he was it was it, he there was actually nothing i couldn't ask him and there was nothing he didn't wasn't willing to sit through and he might have acknowledged or not that something real and interesting was taking place but he would never do it if he didn't have a show that he was selling mm -hmm. because that would be embarrassing like okay let's say that you uh are made a fool of by a journalist but you've got a broadway show and it fills seats well that's excusable i mean look he'd had bad criticism bad critics from the beginning but to do it and not have a show would be it would be vanity and it would be amateurish mm -hmm. uh, and you would look like a schmuck to yourself and that he was not going to allow mm -hmm. uh, that's my read i mean i could be wrong maybe he'd have not called me or you know <laughs> <laughs> not not let me go see it <laughs> The musical, I didn't even realize he was working on a, a musical, yeah. um, a Bunuel musical. It, it's a poignant kind of strain in the book because he himself has said that composers top out by the time they're 50, right? Yeah. And here he is in his late 80s trying to make the magic happen again, and it's hard, and he's struggling. And, and yeah, that for, that for me is the whole emotional subtext of this Yeah, of this I mean, book. he's struggling, although, although, I mean, you know, I saw some of what he was writing, I mean, to, and I went home and played it. Uh, and you can't judge a musical by three measures, mm -hmm. obviously. But I don't think the problem. I don't think the problem for Sondheim was writing the musical itself. I think the problem was he felt like he was too late. Like his kind of musical. And he says this to me. We we meet in Connecticut at his summer house at some point, and he says to me, "I used to listen. To my I used to my father. This is these parallels. I, I my father used to um." listen to Victor Herbert on and I th and he and I just thought Victor Herbert was old-fashioned shit and now I'm the old-fashioned shit <laughs> and I said no 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 you're you know you you can never be the old-fashioned shit because you're my well, effectively you're Sondheim mm -hmm. but which is a risk you know because he'd heard that his whole life but I I felt like I had to say it because it was true and then he said you don't understand really really real genius I said oh and you're a genius I said you're a genius uh, which is like saying uh, you're beautiful to somebody. Like it's a risky, you know, risky. If they know they're beautiful, it's the wrong thing to say. Um, and if they don't experience themselves as beautiful, well, we take your chances. But the main point was he knew he was a genius, right? But what, what, how did that live within him was a question. And he, he was interesting. He, he made a little salaaming gesture and he said, thank you for the word. <laughs> which I thought was an interesting way to put it, um, and very Sondheimian. Uh, and then he said, but real geniuses. So there's a distinction here. Um, and he named Stravinsky, Picasso, and Gershwin, boom, 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 uh, are able to always stay new, and they're able to incorporate the new sounds of their world and the new work of their world, and that's how they're always relevant. And he said, I can't do that. He said, I am basically who I am, I'm a 1950s style songwriter with a love of harmony and I just, you know, and I just can't, I can't. And so I think, I, I think for him, it wasn't that he couldn't actually write it, but he no longer felt like writing it made him the center of the culture. And I, I think he always wanted to be more than the best composer lyricist of our time. He wanted to be one of those people you talk about, you talk about the culture of our day. And he yeah. just, I mean, honestly, you know, if, the Manuel comes out, will we talk about it the way we talk about Lynn Manuel Miranda? I mean, it's, it's a little hard to imagine yeah. that. And he, that bothered him a lot, I think. But at one level, it makes sense. One of the things that becomes clear in your book is that he hasn't listened to, I mean, his, his, his musical appreciation was sort of stuck somewhere in the early 50s. He listened to classical. Right. He listened to, um, to um, Show music, mostly show music, mostly show music, but no pop music, well, no rock, no rock and roll. Radiohead, Radiohead, that was a fascinating exception. Radiohead, because yeah. he liked the har harmonies, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. no rock and roll. It was yeah. okay with jazz. Didn't love opera. So there's so much music. Well, some opera, Puccini, yeah, Puccini, but not Verdi. Yeah, not Verdi, which I find really weird because to <laughs> me, the opera that most closely embodies what Sondheim was trying to do is Rigoletto. Yeah, it's the only opera I've ever seen that I, where the plot. And the music actually makes sense together. Like otherwise, it's gorgeous singing set over inert characters. But yeah. Rigoletto is a story. Yeah, I mean, Sweeney sure. Todd 
it's beautiful and it's tight. Yeah. But he was like, I, I, he said, I, Verdi's, he said, Verdi's harmonies just don't appeal to me. I mean, what do you say when Sondheim says that to you? What do you say? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not entirely sure I know what Verdi's harmonies are. I mean, I, yeah. I know what his music is, but I've never really peeled off the melodies to get in there on the harmonies. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. But uh, there also, of course, he didn't listen to rock and roll. I, I guess he was he was won over to hip hop by Hamilton. I don't know that Just, he was one. I mean, did you know that from some other? I, I, well, he, I know, I know, also. he, I know, he was very respectful of the show. He thought yes. he, he, he was very lavish praise on that show. But sure. I don't know that it took him into you know. Yeah. I mean, I don't. He's not I, listening to Jay Z. And no, then, yeah. and there was no Drake on his shelf. Or, <laughs> there, there's no shelf anymore. But there was you know, if I glimpsed his playlist, it would yeah. be extremely light on. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Know. Also fascinated by he his reading habits. He does he didn't read, read he doesn't read fiction. Didn't seem to read much in the way of poetry even. No. Um, re tell. Read reviews, which yes. I found fascinating. Yeah. Um, I love movies. And love movies, yeah, especially yeah. the old ones. I mean, yeah. it's sort of proof that you can be literary without being a reader of novels, which is sort of a surprising. Yeah. Like he took the quintessence of language, and that's what he liked. He really didn't wasn't he was much less interested in. You know, the building blocks of, of fiction. I guess he was not that interested in the way that you in, you can inhabit another a character's life mm -hmm. on the page. You know, I mean, he he put it down to attention span. He said, you know, I'm the movie generation, but it never quite really. I mean, he, I wasn't the first person he said this to. It has never quite really made sense to me. I mean, he said he said for instance that he loved J D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, and you can see why he would love that book. But he also said he loved. I don't know the King Mutiny, for instance. Yeah. Not really. I mean, it seemed a little random. I, I think it's probably enough to say that he was very, very impatient, and that probably anything that unspooled itself slowly was boring to him. I think that's probably what it came down to. Yeah. I mean, maybe somebody could diagnose a little ADHD there, but I mean, you know, <clears throat> I wouldn't disagree. I just, I just don't know. I mean, he certainly, he, he, as far as he went on my work, is he said that it was, he could tell it was serious. But I never quite knew what that meant either. I mean, it might be a, a euphemism for long, and I'm not going to read it. Maybe he thought there were long words, and I don't know. I mean, I, I, took, I, took I, a, I wonder if there's something. some aging a thing. I, you know, I, th I, th I think people find as they get older. I know I find as I get older, my attention span tends to diminish. Maybe that's the culture. Who knows? But um, um, speaking of reviews. Uh, he, there, there are some artists, famous people, who claim never to read their reviews. I don't know if I ever believe them when they say that, but it, it's it's clear that Sondheim did. He carried some of those ruse around like yeah. a chip a chip on his shoulder. Um, how, what was the what was his relationship? You think with the critical? Well, mass? you know, the weird thing about Sondheim is 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 when did he become our 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 foremost musical theater genius? Because, I mean, when you read the reviews, even the people who are like known Sondheim supporters. They're not that positive. I mean, you know, everyone's got a problem with every Sondheim musical. And stuff now that we just sort of take as brilliant but then maybe don't look at too hard like Pacific Overtures or Sunday in the Park, a lot of pushback. So I think that he, um, you know, theater is weird because millions of dollars rest on these productions, right? It's not like a book. Um, and he needed producers to be willing to produce his musicals. And he needed people to see them. And people would only see them if the critics said to see them. I mean, that was still, for most of his career, the principal way that you sold out a show. Uh, and so he was kind of stuck with the critics. You know, if you look at some of the critics of that day, and they're mostly gone, so I, I don't have to be too discreet, but like Clive Barnes, mm -hmm. you know, who was the foremost Times critic for, what, maybe 20 years. I mean, a truly middle-brow critic. I mean, it, you know, it, critic is the, the reviewers. Like, and they had to write fast, and they give you their impressions, and their impressions generally didn't age very well. Mm -hmm. I think he knew all that. I mean, I just think they were, you know, they were just part of what he had grown. They were part of the, the flavor of Broadway. His career revives. You know, he actually, his career almost, weirdly enough, dies after uh, the failure of Merrily We Roll Along. And he reinvents himself as an off-Broadway musical so when, when off broadway becomes a possibility he finds a new home and a lot of what we love about sondheim a lot of it that's now on broadway really had its life as off broadway productions and and i think that was what partly response to the fact that critics were never quite positive enough to fill a broadway house i mean they are now now i mean now everything opens on broadway i mean you know they do a 
uh, Merrily We Roll Along, and it's going to you know, move to Broadway. And, and there was a company that you know, came from England and is, was on Broadway, and the houses are full. You know, and it's this funny final triumphant act, because if you think about it, like wh what was the last Sondheim musical that people got excited about? But it wasn't his last musical. Wasn't bounce. Wasn't bounce. Uh, yeah. So you yeah. got to go back before that. I'm not even sure. I mean, passion. I don't know. I mean, people laugh on passion. You know, at the first. Yeah. The first uh, at the open opening night. So. You know, he's in an yeah. interesting position where really his last twenty years or fifteen years are really about polishing the legacy by reviving works that earlier had gotten kind of a yes, but, and then on second you know, second time around, he talks about this with me. He's like, you know, people didn't like Sunny in the Park with George, but by now they're used to it and they have no problem with it. So I think he saw that. Yeah. I think he's always coming. I, you speak of Clive Barnes. I recently reread the, the original re Times review for West Side Story. I think, was that Barnes in those days? I can't remember. I, I don't know. No, no he, somebody else. Yeah. Anyway, the reviewer didn't even mention yeah. Sondheim. Yeah. It is strictly Bernstein. He's very proud of And him. Robbins. He yeah, he's not even today. mentioned in the, in the yeah, he's very pr He's very yeah. proud of the fact that, I mean, it's sort of astonishing that someone yeah. would not comment on the lyrics of West Side Story who was reviewing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he did have a great crew. I mean. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He had, I mean, it's funny, you know, that just an aside is, you know, when, when West Side Story comes out and, sh and for the period afterward, you sort of think that like Leonard Bernstein is going to be the Mozart of his day and that Sondheim is, you know, going to be not Salieri, but like a kind of second tier, help me out, like, I don't know, you know, on when you listen to classical music at dinner time and it's a, a march by somebody you've never heard of and then... Yeah, that kind of thing. But, but it turns out that maybe in a way the reverse turned out to be true, and that the greater talent, it seems to me, was Sondheim's. And even though he's just this, the lyric writer for West Side Story, mm -hmm. and the music is wonderful, but whose talent keeps growing and changing? I mean, maybe it doesn't matter that maybe one shouldn't compare them. Yeah. He did. There's a moment when we're in Connecticut where he's talking about being old-fashioned, and he's talking about solutions to it, and he brings up Lenny, and one of the few criticisms Sondheim ever gave to me was when one of these, I wrote a, a, a short piece called a talk piece that was based on one of these encounters. And I, we referred to a quote from him about Lenny. And he wrote me a letter saying, surely you should have said Lenny, Len, Lenny Bernstein. Nobody knows who he is today. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but he, he, he brought up the example of Leonard Bernstein's mass, which has a rock mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. I even remember seeing it, when it on Channel 13. When yeah. it, anyway, and he, he was bringing up as an example of like what, how you really can't change who you are. And he, he, he paused for a moment and he said, a friend of mine uh, referred to that as, and then he paused and said, I really shouldn't tell you. Um, but he said, uh, it reminds me of Rip Van With It. <laughs> and then I looked and around and he had said it one other time so clearly he had the whole thing scripted out with the pause and then yeah. the sort of devilish eyes before he lays the this nasty little dig on Bernstein right right on you he also uh, accused Bernstein of, of developing important titus I think at some point yeah in his, in yeah his career. no I mean in a way I mean I do think it's an interesting situation where Sondheim identified more with the theater mm -hmm. and Bernstein identified more with the art and it may have been that at the end, it was more nourishing to be a member of the theater than to be, you know, whatever Bernstein became. I mean, Bernstein had others. I mean, he's a conductor. I mean, he had a lot of, he had a public portfolio that, that Sondheim probably avoided or at least never had. I mean, maybe people found him too hard to work with to make him the director of a company or something. I don't really know. Um, we're approaching time for questions, so if people want to ask, please come forward and use the microphone. They, they would, that way the people who are, who are streaming this for can hear what you say. Uh, but we'll just keep talking in, uh, in the meantime. Until a question comes. Until a question comes. comes. Now, a um, burning question. When he died, uh, you said November 2021. Uh, he was 91. A lifelong smoker. Uh, no, not, not, I mean, not. Until the last 20 years, maybe? Yeah, I mean, he stopped. He I stopped, yeah. I but I, I was, I, what surprised me at some level was how genuinely shocked people were by his death, you know, by a death that, that actuarially speaking, you yeah. know, would, would, be, would be happening. But... Um, I mean, I was shocked. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was. I mean, you know, he was... I think at one point I described him as a, 
as a he his his comportment was like a seventy year old playing a ninety year old. Like he looked ninety, but he had way too much energy to be ninety. And you know, I mean, we talk about being sharp or not sharp. There was no there was no way in which he didn't seem. You know, sometimes you say that and you're really trying to be nice about a person who's maybe not as sharp as they were, but they're still sharper than they might be. Uh, but he wasn't that person. He was he was 100 percent on, you know, he was. And so, no, I didn't see him. So we our our, our fifth breakup. But by no means, I would think our final breakup <laughs> was, I think it's uh, two years before he dies. And. And some news had come out after that that he was back at work on the Buñuel, um, although I don't know if he really had written new material or not. Um, and then shortly after, he's on the Colbert show of all places. Um, not of all places, actually. Colbert actually was in company. Yeah. Uh, but he, um, anyway, he, um, Colbert says to him, so are you still writing? You know, as if, like... Sondheim was nobody's idea of cute. And anytime, and I think he felt a little, you know, maybe like, and he's like, yeah, in fact, we just did a workshop of the new Buñuel last week. And like, you know, Colbert does that mugging thing and the audience applauds, applauds yeah. you know, and it's like, you know, um, so that would surprise you then that that person would be gone, yeah. you know, in a couple of, I was maybe that's a few weeks before he died. I can't remember, maybe yeah. a month or two before he died. So, I mean, on the other hand, friends of, my, of his said to me afterwards, like, what were we thinking? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, he had yeah. actuarially, as you say, uh, he had, but it, it, it surprised me. I mean, it did surprise me. Absolutely. Um, one of the other Sondheim bombshells that came out over the past, right around the time, same time as your book, was Mary Rogers' mm -hmm. memoir, Shy. I don't know if any of you have read it. Um, pretty eye-opening stuff about Sondheim in that. Were you aware that that book was out circulating in the ether? Uh, I was aware that, yeah, I was aware when they, before they published it. So this is Mary Rogers' memoir, which rather magnificently came out, what, like 10 years after her death? What year did she die? 15 years? I'm not, I'm not sure. So I was once an editor, and I have to say that's a heck of a publishing trick, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I, I actually, I've been told whether the manuscript was just late or whether it was all strategic for Sondheim's death. And I, and I forget the answer, but I think the answer is it was not strategic. Okay. But in the book, there's a kind of heart-rending section um, where uh, Mary Rogers and Sondheim try to live as man and wife in a single bed for a year because she very much wants to marry him. I can't remember if he says he very much wants to marry her. I find that a little harder <laughs> to imagine. It seems like a trial kind of platonic marriage for yeah for a well, year. i think they were hoping to be less platonic if you've seen company although there's many as 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 sondheim pointed out to me he's not franklin shepherd i mean not company if you've seen merrily we roll along but the relationship of of, of franklin shepherd and um what's the name of the the woman yeah mary. anyone mary well yeah there you go <laughs> hey guys <laughs> so um is does feel like there's something there that's not, you know, not entirely um, inaccurate. So anyway, Shy's a wonderful, I mean, he's got a very, good, very good account. And, it's fun. And, and um, I didn't, I mean, I had some Mary Rogers stories from Sunai myself. And one of them was that, you know, he, he liked to be kind of mean about her. I mean, I, I do think that was part of their relationship. And so we were sitting in his first place, he had this wonderful, this house I go into, this maisonette is this beautiful, beautiful, house and it's next to where Catherine Hepburn lived and it was owned by Maxwell Perkins, the famous editor of Hemingway and Fitzgerald. And I mean, it's this perfect little and Garson Canaan. I don't know. Is it possible? I always throw that name in because it seems so perfect for the story, but I actually have no idea if Garson Canaan lived next door or not. And Ruth but, Gordon, maybe. Yeah, maybe well, yeah. Anyway, yeah. anyway, if they couldn't, if they didn't, they would have liked to. <laughs> um, but they, um, uh, so he put, we're on the first floor one time and, and he like, he just points out a place where there used to be a bathroom on the first floor before they renovated it and points out that Mary Rogers, when she would pee, was so embarrassed that she would run the water so no one could hear her. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. Does that, does that show that there was deep love that mm, could be? Sounds like an affectionate sort of anecdote. Yeah, I, I think so. But I mean, okay. he didn't then say, and we 
tried to live upstairs for a year together. Yeah, no, yeah. no luck. No, that was a surprise. I mean, that was a surprise. She does me. refer to him as the love of her life. Yeah, you know, which is that. I think he would have acknowledged. Pretty intense. Yeah. You know, and I don't think she was alone. I mean, you know, he he was famous. He was so Mary Rogers meets him at the Hammerstein's house. So what is he? Fourteen at the time, and she spots in him this once in a generation genius and falls in love. And I mean, and it only gets worse for him from then on. I mean, you know, by the time I am with him at the Penn dinner, you know, and he's 88, I guess. Like, you know, there's no one in that room who isn't aware he's there. First of all, because we're with Meryl Streep. Mm -hmm. And amusingly, you know, he's so competitive that anytime I'm talking to Meryl Streep, like Sondheim will like get in there and kind of put me down. Like we're still in high school and it's like Meryl, Steve, and Dan are in high school together. And I'm thinking like, Steve, what are you thinking? Like, you know, I mean, w w can you never let it go? So like anything I'd say, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd make fun of me. You know, well, these light little kind of, yeah. n nothing mean, but he just didn't want, you know, Meryl Shoot to get too damn fond of me when he was in the room. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was like, okay, we're good. We're all right there. Did you have a question? I, I did. Thanks so much for this um, really riveting conversation. So I two two quick questions for you. One being, was there any conversation about some of the the leading ladies that he often worked with, kind of the Bernadette Peters, Angela Lansbury's, uh, that he continued to work with over the course of his career, and whether he found uh, that he was writing for them or inspired by them in, in some way. And then I also wanted to ask. I've always found his. Um, his collection of work to be somewhat random in subject matter. Mm. He really jumped around. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your conversations um, focused on how he chose what to write about. So the first question was, did he ever talk about kind of the, the women and also maybe the men who, who were the, you know, he had a kind of ongoing group of, um, you know, of artists who he worked with, Bernadette Peters and um, Andy Patinkin and, you know, the, um, and, and we never really talked about particular artists. You know, he was very, um, I wouldn't say he was discreet, but he was, he was aware of feelings being bruised. And if I would ever ask him a question like, you know, who did you think best sang Sweeney Todd? You know, he wouldn't say, because he'd say, if I mention one person, it'll hurt other people's feelings. Um, what I do know is that, you know, he valued a certain kind of intelligent actor over a great voice. Um, and that he felt very strongly that you had to understand the part, much as he understood the part. He said that when he wrote his, this actually answers your second question. So at the same time, you know, in theater, there's someone called a book writer. And unlike in this room where the book writer is the writer, the book writer actually creates the template and then the composer lyricist composes the music and writes the lyrics. And it's kind of an odd relationship because in a sense, what does the book writer do? But the book writer actually does quite a lot. Um, and so for him, you know, he said, when I write the lyrics, I, he said, I read the book like an actor would, not like one of our books, but the, 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 the it's, it's, you know, it's basically the scenes and it has dialogue. It's not always fleshed out so you could play it, but it can be actually effectively a play, although there's usually less in it. Um, and so I think that what he was saying was that like, he, you know, he, he would want the same level. He would expect the same level from the actors. And I know that actors and you know singers, when they would come in, would always sort of try to over prepare because they were aware that you just couldn't you couldn't get Sondheim's approval just by having a lovely voice. And in fact, if you look at who sings Sondheim, so I was just in Madrid, where of all things Antonio Banderas was the lead in Company hmm. as Bobby. So I don't I mean he apologized very charmingly to me that it was the day after. New Year's and he had been out late, so he wasn't in his best voice. But I mean, I thought he did a pretty good job. But the main point is, you don't have to sing, although his songs are really hard to sing, famously hard to sing. At the same time, paradoxically, they're not really singers' songs. They're, they're, they're actors' songs. And so, like, I mean, Jake Lillenhall was not, I mean, anyone who thought, you know, could sing Sunday in the Park. I thought he did a, a terrific job. Um, so I think he was very open to that. And I mean, I know that he was open to Banderas doing it because he approved it before, before he died. I can't quite imagine him saying, you know, but you don't sing to anyone. 
with Glil and Holly actually said to me, you know, and it turns out he can sing. So I don't know. But what, what they would have done if he couldn't was a little hard to imagine. Yes. So, yeah, Daniel, so this idea that a profile should ideally involve uh, 10 interviews, is that, is that your template? Is that a New Yorker uh, no, template? No, I mean, I wish you could claim it was something that, you know, Harold Ross passed on to, <laughs> to, to William Sean. But I, I think it's, it's, um, it's me, but not only me. And I, I don't think it's in, inviolable. I mean, I think I've done many pieces where I didn't, I mean, honestly, first of all, if a person's not nearby, 10 visits would eliminate, would bust any budget in the modern, I mean, this isn't Esquire in the 60s, you know, like, there's no way you would get permission to go 10 times to Spain to see Antonio Banderas, you'd have to group it. But when you had someone nearby, um, you know, I mean, my own experience is, it's, is it's worth it? Uh, and I know a lot of, I mean, I, it's not way out of line with what a lot of the writers a lot of writers do. Well, had you talked to Sondheim long enough to have begun to sort of shape how a profile might have read? Had you gotten around to it? Yeah, I mean, I had the ending. So the ending was going to be this moment where he's look. He talks about death with me, and he talk. He says, actually, I asked him, and he said, you know, I think about it all the time. Uh, um, I just I don't want the end to be painful. And then I said, well, how do you imagine death? Um, and we're in the country. This isn't the question you asked Hassan in the city. You asked this to Hassan in the country. And he said, well, you know, he said in this kind of dark voice, it's, you know, the born from which no traveler returns, from which I concluded that not unreasonably he had nothing new to say about death because... Hamlet already said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I mean, like, what? There's nothing wrong. I mean, that was fine. So, okay, so that would be the next sentence. And then there's a, literally at that moment behind him, there's a, 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 a crew coming around cutting down like dead limbs on the trees. Uh, and he turns and he sees them and he says, uh, you know why they're called total landscape? Because he says, because they total the landscape. <laughs> and so somehow he's going to take him out on a playful note with the idea that language, even, in the, you know, even when thinking about these things, it was always language and pleasure that... Um, that carried him through. But, you know, we never wrote the profile, and so that's like in the middle of the, I mean, it's in the book, but it's, the book now ends with him saying, he says, I don't want to be looked, he said, I don't want to be looked at. Isn't that, I think that's the last thing that he says in an interview, although there are emails after that. Where, and I thought that was an interesting way to, I thought that was an interesting, he didn't say I don't want to be profiled, mm -hmm. or I don't want to see you, mm -hmm. or I'm tired of this. Or, you know, whatever. He said, I don't want to be looked at. Okay, yeah. Which I thought, well, well he'd been looked at a lot in his life. And mm -hmm. I, I, I do think he might have changed his mind if he had something to, to, to be looked at that he could, you know, he wanted his work to be looked at. He was willing to be looked at if the work was going to be looked at. Yeah. Did you ask him at all about The Last of Sheila? I'm, I'm a fan of that movie. I know not many people you know, are. I, but. I didn't. So The Last of Sheila is supposed to be him, right? Am I right about that? Or is that the one he wrote? Sorry. With Anthony Perkins. Yeah, with the screenplay. Okay, right. And, and, yeah. No, and I didn't, I didn't ask him about it. I mean, you know, the, there are other... He was abundantly interviewed, and he does comment on that uh, other places. So, you know, if you type in Last of Sheila and Sondheim, it, it'll, it'll pop up. I can't remember what he what he says about it. I, um, he just didn't know if he wanted to write more movies. I don't, I mean, I don't know. It was all so long ago for him, if you think about it. I mean, I, I think he was very focused on, uh, on the Bunuel to the extent he was doing anything. And, you know, he had a big portfolio of musicals being, part of the time he's reworking company because it's going to have a female lead. So Bobby, he's like, you know, the changes turn out to be much more extensive than I thought they would be. He gets a lot of requests, and I think a lot of it dragged him into work that he maybe wasn't anticipating, but was probably easier, you know, than doing the Bunuel. Um, yeah. If if you've seen Glass Onion, that has allusions to, uh, yeah, that, that movie. Yeah. Um, uh, one, we're almost done, but a quick question. I guess it's quick. The the book is named Finale. That has a final sound to it. Do you feel like you've gotten some kind of last word about Sondheim, or is that ever going to be possible? Well, I mean, it's finale is also um, it's not the last. I mean, a lot of musicals have a finale in it, but I think in, in is it company that has finale. I think um, but uh, um, 
you know, I, I, so there's an authorized biography that's been, that's, that's got to be at least 15 years overdue. And Sondheim would not be a person I would want to have tried to write a biography of. I think it would just wear you out. Uh, um, so I don't know what will come now. I mean, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if the journals, if he kept journals and they'll be published. My instinct is not. Um, he wrote two books about his lyrics and his music, but, but they're tightly controlled works. Um, very competitive, as you would imagine. And, and I don't, I can't really see a letters collection coming out that also doesn't seem like what, the, what he would have wanted. I think what we're waiting for is the Boonwell. I mean, either there will be a musical and, you know, I don't think anyone thinks he finished it. Like not finish, finished, but did he get 40% of the way, 60% of the way? What does that mean? He tells me about the Boonwell that he, the first act is done and he knows where the second, where the songs go in the second act. But other people told me he wasn't really satisfied with what he'd done in the first act. And so that would delay it. And now let's imagine you're one of our nation's most prominent composer lyricists. Let's say I'm the Sondheim estate and I send you an email asking if you'd like to finish um, this <laughs> movie. The, the music is called Square One. Like, would you want to do it? Or would you like not want to do it? I mean, what is, what is, the, what is the legacy if you finish it well, the credit probably goes to Sondheim. And if you finish it badly, people just can beat you up endlessly for having, you know, degraded this. This So, I mean, I would duck that call and stick to my own work. Oh, yeah, for sure. For um, sure. So, would we get a two-thirds done? Do we want to see a two-thirds done musical? I mean, I would. I'd I don't think he would. I don't think, no, he, I he, think he'd be too proud to put out a... Although, a, you movie. know, he was also... The thing about Sondheim, just to, to finish, is he was a theater guy. Like, he... I mean, the reason that Antonio Banderas could do company with a 45-year-old Bobby, which is way older, 40, way older than the original Bobby, the reason Marion Elliott could do a Bobby with a female lead, um, the reason that you can do into the one act of Into the Woods at your high school is because he wanted, he wanted his, his musicals performed. It wasn't enough to have, like, you know, Barbara Cook's album. Like, he, they, were, they were, you know, they were a work... And they, he wanted them performed. He didn't want songs sort of cleaved off. And he would have, so, so it was really important for him. So I don't know whether that would extend to the Buñuel. I mean, right now we're in this, like, this paroxysm of revivals. And there's Sweeney Todd, and I'm sure we'll get more, you know. Um, but that will, at some point, people will be like, well, you know, what, where is the Buñuel? And was it done? And, you know, I mean, I don't know. My instinct is we'll see something. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.